Okay, uh, what we've got here is the um, is the Mackie CR1604 VLZ 16 channel mic and line mixer. Now uh, I've got this thing set up with a microphone plugged into channel one. Uh, channel one, funnily enough, is the one channel whose uh, input pot uh, is a bit damaged, uh, but the other ones are absolutely fine. Um, but at least it shows that despite the damage, this is working fine. Um, so let's just have a quick look at what we've got on uh, each of these channels. And um, probably easier for me to um, point these things out uh, as we go through on one of these other uh, one of these other channels. Here we are. So at the top end, we've got uh, uh, the gain trim control. Uh, quite a wide range of gain trim. Then auxiliary sends, uh, one, two, three, four. And um, there's actually six sends in total because three and four can be swapped over to be five and six. So potentially six sends. Um, but one and two are switchable so that they can be pre or post fade. Uh, so you can use one and two for cues, uh, monitors for the band or whatever. Uh, whereas the three and four are always, and five and six are always post fade, but you can make one and two post fade as well for, for mix down if that were a particular criterion for you. So uh, we we'll say we've got uh, 16, the 1604, um, strange designation, but anyway, uh, 16 channels and it's 16 actual microphone inputs, mic or line. Uh, so there's no messing about with uh, with additional uh, stereo feeds or anything to get the numbers up. This is pure and simple 16 channel. So if you've got a 16 channel recorder and you want to do acquisition, this gives you 16 mic preamps. Each channel has, um, <clears throat> as I said, the auxiliaries, but also EQ. And uh, as is fairly common with these Mackie devices, You've got uh, some high frequency EQ, which you can hear there. You've got a swept mid, uh, which we can give it a bit of boost there and we can hear it being moved around as I change the, the mid, sweep the mid frequency. Set that back again. And some low boost there. Or cut, uh, 80 hertz shelving filter. But there's also a steep low cut filter, 75 hertz which I can pull in there and I'll take the bottom off altogether. Each channel's got... No, I've just demonstrated it. Each channel's got a mute button. Um, there is an overload lamp here, which will come up when the thing is actually overloaded. Um, but when you hit mute, like so, the uh, mute uh, is shown by the overload lamp being on permanently. There's also a signal indication uh, just of activity. You can see it flickering there. It comes in at minus 20 dB. So uh, it shows if you've got just something going on, which is quite useful, especially in a PA context where you might just want to know whether a microphone is dead or not. I've switched on phantom power on this system uh, because it's, an, uh, it's a uh, condenser microphone. Uh, again, like most of these cheaper mixers, it's a global phantom power switch. So switch that on, phantom power on all the microphones. Now there's a bit of assignment here, uh, this, because there's four uh, groups that you can set. Um, <clears throat> so not only can you assign to the left-right bus, which I can do on and off with that, like so. Uh, uh, by the way, you can hear some noise in the background, that's... Um, so uh, fridges and ovens and things. Um, you can also assign it to 1-2. Um, so that channel is to 1-2, which is these two here. And the pan pot will steer between between 1 and 2, as if they were left and right. Um, and to 3 and 4, this pair here. And again, you can steer between the two of them. So you can set up... Uh, four individual uh, sends if you wish uh, or you can have them as two stereo pairs so there's potential for using this thing uh, in some kind of four track recording uh, concept but um, the old, other alternative is to use that to set up subgroups for say uh, drum mixes and things like that it is a very straightforward mixer uh, <clears throat> you've got the groups here 
And as I say, uh, they can go out at the back and I'll show you the back panel in a moment because that's really where it all goes on. Um, <clears throat> but you can also assign these uh, to the left or right of the main mix. Uh, it, this is unusual really that uh, one and two, uh, instead of just being fixed left, right, you assign them to the left, right mix. Um, you can you could perversely put one to right and two to left if that's what floated your boat. So there we are. You've got uh, the usual, again, the usual thing for this grade of mixer. You've got a, a headphones output, which is the same as a control room output, which is on the back. Um, and on this matrix here, you have one, uh, one level knob for control room and phones. And uh, you can select that to listen to the main mix. Uh, subs three and four, subs one and two, or tape. Tape is a, another RCA phono input uh, which comes in here and you can sling that tape to the mains um, and uh, so you can have it simply coming in here uh, for being picked up and sent to the mains or you can bring it into here listen to it on the headphones for cue and when something comes in that you want you can sling it to the mains uh, with that button there. Finally, uh, the soloing arrangement. Uh, when you press one of the uh, solo buttons, like so, again, you won't hear that the uh, solo kill there because uh, you're actually listening to the main outs and not the control room outputs. But when you hit a, a solo, first of all, you get the rude solo lamp. So that uh, is showing you it's winking away. If you can see that, yeah. Um, to indicate that at least some solos pre pressed in. Now, again, when you solo, you get a permanent uh, display on this uh, minus 20 dB thing. So instead of flickering, it's on permanently. So kind of like the overload thing, it's a dual purpose uh, indicator. That will tell you which one is being soloed. Now you kind of need that sort of thing because it's not very clear from these buttons whether they're pressed in or, or out. They don't go down very far and there's no special color coding halfway down the, the button to indicate where it is. So uh, finally with the solo you can adjust the level at which that appears. The solo appears in the, um, in the headphones or control room mix and you can determine whether it's uh, after fade listen or pre fade listen. So you've got the option to do either there um, and uh, in the after fade listen obviously it will take into account the state of the faders in pre-fade listen, you can use that for setting the level of individual uh, individual tracks. So if I press that in there and solo the microphone that I'm actually talking on, uh, I can use that to set the gain level with the gain control here. And it's suggesting that I should set the thing uh, up to about there. So there we are. And I take that off. Again, there's another indicator there to show you're in level set mode. And I'll take the solo off and I should now be at the ideal level for um, operating. Uh, <clears throat> just have a quick look at the auxiliary sends here. Um, as you can see, uh, we've got auxiliary sends um, one and two. Um, and we've got auxiliary turns here. Uh, one, two, three, and four, all stereo auxiliary returns, and various assignment options, which allows you to send things like reverb to headphone monitors or whatever you've got at the uh, at the sharp end where the uh, where the artists are actually singing or playing. And there's no uh, direct uh, level setting for the uh, three, four, five, six. They just go out as they are. But one and two are pretty important because they may be your monitors and you might want to be checking for hooting, howling or anything like that. And as such, uh, you can solo the, uh, the auxiliary sends uh, to check for the quality of what's going out there. So that's it really, apart from the uh, lamp um, socket there for a gooseneck. Um, probably fit an LED one now rather than a, um, an incandescent one. Uh, all the all the channels as I say are identical here so there's no point in going through those. I will turn the thing round in a second and we'll have a look at the uh, rear panel because that's where all the connectors uh, appear. One of the things that needs to be uh, mentioned at this point is that the 1604 can be 
um, physically arranged in several different ways. This is a, a sort of a kind of clean appearance that you get with by default, uh, which has all the connectors on the back. Now that's quite useful um, because in, in a studio situation you'd all be patched in, um, you'd have everything coming out through patch bays, so you'd never go fiddling around the back of the uh, unit. In fact, you'd probably leave it switched on and bring it up with a, with a, separate, uh, with a separate power isolator. But you can also swing the rear panel round and make it appear on the top here. If you're in a, in a tight project studio and you're, you don't have a patch bay, you're always repatching directly onto the mixer, you can swing this rear podule round and have it pointing upwards. You can even turn the whole thing round completely and bolt it on the back so that the unit is only this high um, and then mount it in a rack if you're using it say as a keyboard mixer uh, somebody's got about half a dozen keyboards you could use this as a keyboard mixer put it in a, a vertical rack uh, and then have all the connectors coming out at the back literally behind the thing now to help you do all these things um, <coughs> Yeah, a bit of noise there. It's all heavy metal this. Um, this is a, a back panel that can be put onto the back here. This is all part of an additional um, um, pod extension that I bought for this thing. Uh, you can use this to cover the back and then swing the back round uh, so that the connectors all appear on the top. So this is part of the arrangement. And then because if you go to rack mount this thing, it has different sizes depending on what things you've got fixed to it. Um, these are rack wings uh, for the thing in its fully extended form, as you see here, and, and the uh, screws will go through the rack wings here, hold it all on. So there's a, there's a pair of full length rack wings, but there are also a pair of shorter rack wings. And these are the ones that would, you would use if the thing was in its uh, in its mode in a rack mounted arrangement, uh, probably a vertical rack mounted arrangement, where this is completely invisible because it's right at the back of the unit. So uh, quite a versatile uh, physical arrangement. And to say, I've got all these adapters purchased separately. So let's go and have a look at the back of the unit now. So here we've got the, the rear of the unit and uh, it's uh, again fairly straightforward arrangement as I say this this rear panel could appear on the top or it could appear swung round so that it's actually lower down and these are pointing directly backwards in the opposite direction of the front panel. Power input this again is a fixed voltage device so it's a 230 240 nominal European uh, voltage, power on, so this internal power supply. The only thing to mention about this is that the power supply does get quite warm so after a while it's not failed on me over the years but it does get warm so expect that there's no fan in this thing. Phantom power, global phantom power, so switch that on all of these things 48 volts. So if you put dynamics in here, either the phantom's off or you make sure that your dynamics are wired so that they're properly balanced and they're not affected by the phantom power. Main outs here, left and right. Now balanced or unbalanced. These are a balanced feeds, but they're on, uh, they're on jack sockets here. There are no XLR males uh, like there are strangely on the smaller mixers. I think it's just they've run out of space here. There is a mono output. Uh, but it's just a pure mono output uh, with a variable level. So it's described in the, in the uh, service manual or in the operator's manual as for, for Mr. Camcorder. Uh, well, I'm not, not sure camcorders even want mono these days, but there we are. Uh, main insert, so you can insert into the uh, main line just before it comes out of the mains uh, to put an overall compressor or overall EQ if you were you know, if you for some reason chose to use this for, for mastering or mix down. Tape input and output. Tape output is just the main is the main feed, uh, the main outputs. Tape input comes in as I mentioned earlier is a routing uh, in there which you can use that if you've got a PAE context uh, you could use that for putting in 
either sound effects or more likely interval music. Control room output, so these are the same as the microphone, as the headphone uh, socket, um, but, but for feeding to your control room monitors. Uh, sub out, so you've got the four subs here, all independent, you can send those out as, as whatever you like. Uh, auxiliary returns, now you'll see you've got one, two, three, four, that's a look, one, two, three, four, left and right, that's it, so you've got four returns left and right. Auxiliary sends, as I mentioned, we've got six sends, the first two are, uh, are pre-fade or post-fade, post but mainly used for pre-fade, for, for fold-back. Three, four, five, six, they're available uh, for um, post-fade effects. There are no effects built into this system, there's no computer interfaces, nothing. It's just a simple mixer. Um, direct outs come out here, and they are direct outs from the tape outputs, which I believe are the first, let me just check that, I think it's the first eight channels but they are, they are direct outs. Um, however, if you're using this thing, say for 16-track multi-track work, you'd be using the inserts here as the way of getting out to tape or to your recorder and back in again. Each channel got line input and uh, XLR for, uh, uh, for microphones. And the one thing I should have mentioned earlier on, it is very, very heavy. So that's it, that's the Mackie CR1604 VLZ, 16 channel mic and line mixer.